Hello, we're here with Erin Dury, who is running for Seattle School Board District 5. Would you like to go ahead with a two minute introduction? Yeah, and it's District 4. Um, Four, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, my name is Erin Dury. I'm running for school board for District 4. Um, I have been in the position since uh, mid end, end of March um, from the vacancy from Eden Mack. And I'm really, really excited to run for the full position. Um, there's just a lot going on at the school, as we all know. And, um, and it's a really great opportunity to consider, reconsider how we look at education as we come back from COVID and we're forced to, uh, to really redo education in a lot of ways. And, and so now it's our opportunity to address the issues that were really highlighted and spotlighted throughout COVID that have been in the district, including equity, um, and um, ed access to education for IEP students, um, students across the board, and really reconstruct and deconstruct, deconstruct and reconstruct how we're doing education. Um, I'm really excited to be working with the current board and the leadership that's very dedicated to these priorities as well. And with the new interim superintendent, Brent, Dr. Brent Jones and his staff coming in as well. Um, you can see in the last few weeks that they've been here, the amount of work that has been done. And I imagine that that will continue. And I'm excited to be part of that and to really be in the work and, and be that bridge from the community to the uh, leadership of SPS, ensuring that education is ac accessible to all the students in our neighborhood schools. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so now I'll move into the uh, prepared questions and uh, place number one into the chat box, Katie. Um, the responses to these are two minutes apiece. Great. Um, what policies will you seek to ensure that all students, regardless of gender, race, class, disability, or ethnicity, receive an education to reach their fullest potential? What would you do to advance anti-racist and indigenous curriculum and promote racial equity in SPS? Um, thanks for that question. Uh, uh, I think it starts with a uh, policy that we passed uh, just the other week, policy 2190, which was about um, highly capable and accelerated learning, where we're really focusing on moving that model to um, include education at the rate and um, in a way that is accessible to the students in their a home build in their neighborhood school and building. Um, and I think that's a really important thing to focus on is how do we educate students and meet their needs where they are. Um, and, and I think we can continue that while we look at IEP um, access to all students as well. Um, in, again, in their classrooms and in their neighborhood schools. Um, and I think that to advance uh, anti-racist and indigenous curriculum, we really need to be looking at ethnic studies. There's some work being done already at the district in this area, but it needs to be done. Um, it needs to be, ethnic studies needs to be part of our education across, not just a standalone classroom. It should be integrated into how we educate students from pre-K all the way through 12th grade. Thank you. Um, question two. What would you do to advocate for ample and equitable funding for K through 12 education, including special education, school nurses, counselors, mental health professionals, and paraeducators? Students in special education continue to not receive the education that they were morally and legally entitled to. How would you ensure that students, educators, and schools are supported both with policy and funding? Um, I think this is a really important question. We really do need to um, fully fund public education in the United States and in Washington and in Seattle. Um, and so I think there needs to be a focus of advocacy to ensure that that's happening in our country, in our state, in our city, um, across the board. So there is a, there's a, to me, there's that advocacy arm ensuring that um, we're getting, getting the public, the funding that we need um, to fully fund education in our in our schools um and that like i said goes from all the way from the country down to our local um, jurisdictions and in addition i think that it is that we do really need to look at how ptas play a role in our um in our schools and access to funding and look at different models of funding for um fund fundraising and funding from ptas that is more equitable 
and citywide um, and not consolidating money in schools that um, already have more access um, and resources. So, you know, looking at models such as Portland, where there are where PTA funding is pooled at a state level, or a, sorry, at a district level, and redistributed to schools in that way, um, and exploring other potential op options in that manner. Um, and how would I ensure? Thank you for putting these in the chat, by the way. How would I ensure that students, educators, and schools are supported both? Um, and so, yeah, that that tracks with the second part of that question. Um, we just, I think the focus of um, the, the current um, strategic plan, Seattle Excellence on really focusing on black male students in particular, um, will promote policy and funding that um, focuses on equity and ensuring that students have the, have the greatest access to the resources that they need. So continuing with that model and that, um, that focus is important as well as including students for this from educational justice, regardless of ability or disability. Great, thank you. Perfectly on time. Uh, <laughs> question number three. For several years, directors and leaders have said that SPS's enrollment projections were significantly flawed and coming off of a year of online school, these concerns regarding enrollment projections and budget loom large. What will you do to ensure that the district accurately projects enrollment and school budgets for the 2021-2022 year and in the future? Um, yeah, I think it's undeniable that this last year is creating a wrinkle. Uh, in my background, I've worked in um, child advocacy and court-appointed special advocates of the state of Oregon. And one of the things we did, this was in funding, was to look at a different funding model that included a three-year rolling average of funding. Um, and that was based on um, the, the zero to 18 population of each county. And I think that was a really good model and something that we could pull forward into looking at enrollment projections is to take a more longer view of um, what's what has happened in the past in our enrollment and also to look at what the population of the zero to 18, zero to 20 even population of, of um, folks in the city and in the district is and sort of do a comparable analysis between what what the potential for students coming in is and what the, the actuals in the, in the past rolling few years have been. Um, I think those would be a few ways to really dig into how do we look at enrollment numbers. Um, also addressing where the flaws were in the calculations before um, and, and making sure that, you know, your data is only as good as the questions you ask. So making sure we're asking the right questions to get the information that we're needing. Thank you. And question four, I'll read that one. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Do you support SPS continuing option schools such as language immersion, um, STEM, STEAM, international uh, bachelorette, uh, project based and other opportunities at specific schools? And do you support uh, continued transportation for K through eight students to such option schools to offer families equitable public school choices? Yeah, I think we do need to take a look at the option schools. I think that there is definitely a um, place for option schools. There are there are schools like, for example, dual language or language immersion that um, that serve a very particular purpose that we may not be able to get in every single building. Um, but we need to be very considerate in what um, what we mean by that and what the what the gap us that school would be filling that we're not able to have in every neighborhood classroom and see why that is. Um, and, and I think the transportation piece is key. Uh, we, we option school should be city draw. And if we aren't providing transportation to get to the school, then that doesn't really create a city draw school. Um, it, it creates a, another neighborhood option for certain neighborhoods. Um, or access to students that could 
students and families that can get across the city on their own. Um, so if we're going to be providing opportunities like that, I think we do have to fully support them in our transportation and in our funding of them and making sure that they truly are accessible to students across the entire district in that way and providing an opportunity that they wouldn't have in their neighborhood school and couldn't be provided in their neighborhood school. Great, thank you. Uh, so now we're going to open it up to uh, follow ups and the um, responses to these are one minute apiece. Any follow up questions? I have one. Um, so my question is more like related to just you know, like your, your passion, right? So um, what particular um, issue motivates you to serve on, on the school board? What's your, uh, what's your favorite? What's your favorite one? topic? <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I think it's this is going to be a bit broad, um, but I I um, I don't know, the word believe seems odd to me, but I believe I fully believe in public education and educational access for everyone, and I think um, that the only way to really do that is to ensure that everyone truly does have access to a quality education that meets their each individual needs. Um, and so I, the the piece that's drawing me to Seattle Public Schools in particular in this moment, as I mentioned in the intro, is that um, there is a very hyper focus on equity on black students and creating access for um, students for this from educational justice. And I think that that is incredibly important in our education system. And I think that we are have an amazing opportunity with the leadership and sort of a reshift of mindset um, from from the time in COVID to amplify that opportunity. And I think that um, my background in change management and working in community-based organizations brings a lot to the table for that, this particular moment in time and that particular shift. Great, thank you. Any other follow-ups? I have more. Um, <laughs> One of the questions that was submitted uh, to us uh, was, and some of these come from our members. Uh, so how can you, uh, how would you manage serving the public in this position? Um, you know, it doesn't pay anything and it has little support. Like, how, um, so they're, they're more curious about like, how are you, your, um, how, how, how would you serve in the position um, knowing that that's a thing currently? Yeah, yeah, that's a thing. That's definitely a thing. Um, I'm a single mom and I have a full-time job. Um, and so, you know, um, I've been fortunate to be in this position um, in the interim for about two months now and have learned um, uh, how to juggle a little bit more, how to lean on community, on my neighbors and friends and things like that to um, help when needed, uh, dropping off dinner sometimes because I'm stuck in a board meeting and, you know, things like that. So there's that component of it of just like um, being real about time. And, and I've had conversations with board members and staff and stuff being like, I can't, I, you know, like we have to keep these meetings contained or we have to, you know, do different things because um, I have a son to take care of uh, half the time at least, you know, or a job that I need to be at. Um, and then I think there was a second part of that question is how to engage community. And I, and I do wanna address this. I think that's incredibly important for people in positions of power, um, especially white women in positions of power uh, to really stay connected to the community, to the students, to the staff, to the people who are on the ground and most affected by the decisions that are being made at the board level. Um, and I think that we really need to uh, be like seek out um, voices that don't necessarily have access to the board meetings or to the online chat portals or the things like that and really ensure that we are hearing from the folks that are really impacted and affected by the decisions and policies being made. Great, thank you. Any other follow-ups from the board members? Because I have more from people. <laughs> All right, uh, this question is, I guess, kind of, um, it's, it's good for, for our district only, um, and for what we do here in the 36th, uh, as far as like policy is concerned. Um, so uh, 
this is more along the lines of what, what should the school district be doing to better prepare students to be citizens, active citizens in our communities? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so the school board is currently moving to a student outcomes based governance model. Um, and we've been working with a consultant uh, around doing that and creating very specific goals and guardrails that the board will be focused on to sort of help uh, take the board out of the weeds of some of the work that's really staff related. Um, and I started that for a very particular reason and I forgot the question. Can you size <laughs> preparing students to be um, effective citizens. and yes. citizens? Um, yeah. So in those conversations, one of the things that I kept thinking of is we really need to create critical thinkers and self advocates. Like this is what we need to be able to be full citizens, in my opinion, in our society. We need to be able to participate. We need to be able to know what our needs are. We need to be able to think critically about what we're being told and educated on in general, even into adulthood, right? And so as we we're creating these goals and guardrails, I kept being like, how do we create a goal around this? Um, and our goals are very focused on math literacy, but we did get a social emotional one in there that sort of does start getting to addressing this point. And it becomes something that the board can continue to monitor. You have to put data sets around it so the board can continue to monitor it. And we can continue to ensure that we are taking a holistic view of the students that are in Seattle public schools and not just, and, and to really set them up to be not just um, you know benchmarks on math and things like that, but to be fully participatory citizens in our nation or wherever they end up. <laughs> Great, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I have another, um, let's see. Sorry, I'm not wearing my contacts apparently. <laughs> <laughs> It's early on a Saturday. I'm so. <laughs> like trying to see. I'm like, I know I have more. Um, so let's see here. Oh, so this is more about you, uh, community activities, organizations, things you've been involved with. I'll give you a minute to, to talk about that. Okay. Um, yeah, my background's in nonprofit management and leadership. Uh, so um, I've been involved in sexual assault prevention is where my career started. Um, and I still, you know, I think you still stay involved in things as you move on. Even, uh, the bulk of my career was really in child advocacy. Like I mentioned with court appointed special advocates, that was in Oregon. I do know the state director here. And so have stayed involved with that, um, in Washington in that way as well. Um, and then I worked at um, a homelessness prevention agency here in Seattle, the West Seattle Helpline, and so have been involved in homelessness prevention efforts in, throughout the city. Um, I'm connected to the Ballard Food Bank here in Ballard. And then through the work and the board, I've been really focused on connecting with youth organizations like the NAACP Youth Council um, and things like, and, and other youth focused organizations to ensure that we're getting the youth voice. Um, and then as a parent, you know, my son is in sports and uh, after school activities, so that takes a chunk of my time. Um, but I do tend to just sort of get involved in whatever, in, in the different aspects of um, things that are in my life uh, and what my friends and neighbors are doing as well in whatever way I can. Um, I really feed off of being part of community. Um, it's very important and central in my life. And so um, anytime I get an opportunity to engage in that way, I. I try to take it. Great, thank you. And that brings us to time. So if you would like to give a one minute wrap up. Okay, uh, um, well, thank you um, for your time and, and having this space and your consideration. Um, I am, like I said, I've been in this role for two months now. And uh, before that I was involved with the Seattle Council PTSA and my son's PTO at his school. Um, and it's just been a really uh, fulfilling and rewarding position to be in. And I, and it's, it's, uh, it's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot going on, um, but I really enjoyed it and getting to know all the different schools and the different people in the community. And I really truly look forward to continuing to do this work. Like I said, between the goals and guardrails that the board is doing, um, returning students to buildings and schools and taking a really, um, hard look at what we're doing and how we provide education. Uh, it's, 
I think really important and I'm super excited to be able to be part of that and uh, and ensure that we continue to center black and brown students and students for this from educational justice, especially when we're talking about district four um, and how what role does district four play in that and and how can we be advocates for education for children and access for education for children and meeting their needs in their buildings and in their neighborhood schools and I think I'm really excited to continue to do that. So thank you for your time. Thank you.